All right, I'm going to pray for us, and we'll start our equipping hour time together. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for another Sunday, uh, first day of the week, uh, the day that celebrates week after week uh, an empty tomb, uh, the resurrection of our Lord, your Son, Jesus the Messiah. And what a privilege it is to gather together to boldly, openly, and in our day in our country for now freely proclaim his death, burial, and resurrection on behalf of sinners. Lord Jesus, you are our only hope. We have no other Savior but you. There is no one else we could look to. There is nothing else we could want in a Savior but what is found in you. Uh, being fully God, taking on human flesh, and standing in our place as our substitute, absorbing the entire infinity of the wrath of your Father on behalf of those who would believe that we might be forgiven, justified, reconciled, free, saved. We want all praise to go to you as we contemplate the doctrine of salvation here this morning and in the coming weeks. And we know that you have ordered salvation, orchestrated salvation, initiated and completed salvation, all to the praise of the glory of your grace. And we want that refrain to be on our lips as well. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Equipping Hour. Uh, we come to the beginning of a five-part series on the doctrines of grace. And we're going to spend uh, this morning and the following four Sundays together thinking through uh, what it means that God saves sinners. So this is a topical, systematic, theological series on the gospel, on God's plan to save sinners. And we've broken it up into five parts. That is reflective of five points. If you're familiar with the five points of Calvinism, uh, that essentially functions as our outline for this week or for the next five weeks. And it was in uh, 1564 that John Calvin died. And if you've ever read uh, John Calvin's commentaries or read his uh, systematic theology, uh, his institutes of the Christian religion, um, then you would probably have recognized they're not broken up into five chapters, right? That's not, a, that's not a book of five sections. John Calvin never penned five points. Uh, he never organized his system of the explanation of God saving sinners into five chapter headings. So the five points of Calvinism is something sort of posthumous and a little bit pejorative. That means it came about after he died, and it was uh, developed into five points as something of an argument against his system. Uh, it was a disciple or a one-time student of Calvin named uh, Jacob Hermann or James Hermann or James Arminius, to use the Latinization of his last name, uh, from which we get the, the title of a system of doctrine called Arminianism. It was his disciples after Arminius' death who convened a meeting, and they were called the remonstrants, that is, the arguers. That is, they had decided that they didn't quite agree with what Calvin had articulated as a biblical framework for salvation. And after Calvin's death, after Arminius' death, the disciples of Arminius got together as the remonstrants, the arguers, and put together a series of five points by which they pointedly disagreed with John Calvin's articulation of a biblical doctrine of salvation. So you can read about those five points in their full format in Philip Schaff's Creeds of, uh, of Christendom, but I want to give you James Packer's summary of them so that we understand the five points that the disciples of Arminius had in disagreement with John Calvin's articulation of the gospel. Are we tracking? Okay, we're several layers deep already, and we just started, and we're five minutes into a equipping hour. So here are the five points of the remonstrance summarized by J.I. Packer. Number one, man is never so completely corrupted by sin that he cannot savingly believe the gospel when it is put before him. That's point number one. Point number two, man is never so completely controlled by God that he cannot reject the gospel. 
Point number three, God's election of those who shall be saved is prompted by his foreseeing that they will, of their own accord, believe. Number four, Christ's death did not ensure the salvation of anyone, for it did not secure the gift of faith to anyone. There is no such gift. What it did was rather to create a possibility of salvation for everyone if they believe. And point number five, it rests with believers to keep themselves in a state of grace by keeping up their faith. Those who fail here fall away and are lost. So you can hear the sort of mirrored images if you're familiar with TULIP, that acronym that describes the, the reaction to the five points of the remonstrance. So the remonstrance, the arguers have pointed out five ways they disagree with Calvin's articulation of the gospel. And then the Synod of Dort, Synod of Dort just means a synod is a meeting, Dort is a place, it's a city in the Netherlands. So a meeting in Netherlands convened under the auspices of the Dutch government to answer the remonstrance. Okay, so we've got Calvin's articulation of the gospel, five points of argument against that gospel, and now five answers to the five arguments. That's the history of the five points of Calvinism. And the Synod of Dort was convened in 1618, the Remonstrants wrote in 1609, and Calvin died in 1564. So you can see we're many decades after Calvin's death that we have the birth of the five points of Calvinism. We are covering this subject in five weeks, so we will walk through them, and we will walk through them according to the acronym that perhaps you're familiar with, TULIP. Okay, you see the... the, um, The five points listed up there on the screen with the acronym TULIP. T stands for total depravity. U stands for unconditional election. L stands for limited atonement. uh, I stands for irresistible grace. P stands for perseverance of the saints. We're going to tweak each of these titles a little bit. Uh, Some of them uh, perhaps don't reflect everything we'd like to say about the gospel. The framework is good. Um, Sometimes, particularly number three, limited atonement, makes it sound like the cross work of Jesus was puny and tiny and small. And as we'll see when we get to a discussion of limited atonement, uh, both sides of this argument limit the atonement work of Christ. By the way, the word atonement just means at one meant. It's an English invention uh, attempting to describe the propitious act whereby God makes enemy parties into one. God propitiates himself, that is, he assuages his own wrath by a substitute in order to bring parties that were at enmity into friendly relations. Okay, that's atonement. Um, So the the question on number three, uh, in what sense is the atonement limited, is appropriate. Uh, Everybody believes in a limited atonement, and on both sides of this debate, unless you're a universalist and you believe everybody is made at one with God, including Adolf Hitler and Satan himself, if you believe in the gospel and you believe in hell and you believe in heaven and, and there is a path to one and a path to the other, everybody believes in a limited atonement of sorts. And the question really is, what is limited? Is it limited by extent or limited by effect? In other words, did Jesus die for everybody in the same way and accomplish the same things for everybody, giving everybody an equal playing field so that by their own ability they can grab on to what Christ did equally for all? Or, uh, that that would mean the, the, the extent is unlimited, but the effects are limited. Or did Christ die in order to actually secure the salvation of believers? That would mean the effects of it are unlimited. Jesus accomplished everything that he intended for his own. He laid down his life for his sheep and brought them to himself and secured their salvation and purchased their redemption and forgiveness of sin and actually brought about reconciliation by the cross. But its extent is limited to believers. Does that make sense? So we'll get there when we get there. But it means that I don't particularly like the limited part of limited atonement. Others have spoken of particular redemption. I like that better, but that would have us spell tulip rather than tulip. And so it's harder to remember, and it doesn't honor the Netherlands where the tulips are grown and the five points were sort of formulated at the Synod of Dort. So we'll stick with tulip and we'll redefine limited when we get there. 
All right, let's talk about total depravity this morning. And we want to um, distinguish, for our purposes this morning, total depravity from universal depravity. Universal depravity is simply the doctrine that everybody sins. Everybody sins. Everybody since Adam and Eve, everybody born from the seed line of Adam and Eve, are sinners by nature and sinners by behavior, and that behavior flows out of nature. And so there's nobody excluded. The Lord Jesus Christ uh, would be the exception to the rule, but this is why you have the virgin birth. This is why he is God in the flesh. He had to escape the stain of the sin line through Adam. So the doctrine of universal depravity is simply that everyone sins. Uh, 1 Kings 8, 46, there is no man who does not sin. Psalm 14, verses 1, there is no one who does good. And verse 3, they have all turned aside. They have all become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Psalm 130, verse 3, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? And the Bible goes on and on and on and on and on about universal depravity. And I hope that there's no one in this room who denies the doctrine of universal depravity. And, and usually when that doctrine is, it is denied, it is denied about little old me, right? And some of us may practically deny the doctrine of universal depravity when applied to ourselves, even if we might ascribe to it creedily. We tend to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. That's one of the evidences that we're all sinners, is that sometimes we just act and think like we're not. It's part of the contamination. But total depravity is slightly different than universal depravity. Total depravity is not the doctrine that everybody sins. That's universal depravity. Total depravity is the doctrine that sin affects every aspect of the human constitution. That total depravity is an infection that is thoroughgoing in its nature. It consumes and absorbs all that you are, all of your faculties, all of your capacities, through and through, inside and out. That is total depravity. The doctrine of total depravity does not mean that every man is always as bad as he could possibly be. We do believe in a relative goodness. Jesus said, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. There is a, 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 a substantival evil that is uh, congruent with every single human being, and yet evil people can do relative good. That's a matter of God's common grace. We're not as bad as we could be. There is a restraining effect of God's grace on humanity, and we don't always live up to the fullness of our evil capacities. Total depravity simply means that every capacity of man is affected by the fall and infected by sin. Here's Thomas Boston in his work, Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. The heart that was made according to God's own heart is now the reverse of it, a forge of evil imaginations, a sink of inordinate affections, and a storehouse of all impiety. Behold the heart of the natural man as it is opened in the text of the scriptures. The mind is defiled. The thoughts of the heart are evil. The will and the affections are defiled. The imaginations of the thoughts of the heart, that is, whatsoever the heart frames within itself by thinking such a judgment, choice, purpose, device, desire, every inward motion. Rather, the whole frame of the thoughts of the heart, the frame, the make, the mold of it is evil. From the first day to the last day in this state, they are in midnight darkness. There is not the glimmering of the light of holiness in them. Not one holy thought can ever be produced by the unholy heart. Oh, what a vile heart is this. What a corrupt nature is this. The tree that always brings forth fruit, but never good fruit, whatever soil it be set in, whatever pains be taken with it, must naturally be an evil tree. And of man being created in God's image, John Calvin states, we grant that God's image was not totally annihilated or destroyed in man, yet it was so corrupted that whatever remains is frightful deformity. These are good summaries of the doctrine of total depravity. I've given you uh, five hash marks. They don't have numbers on them because that could get confused with five parts of a flower in the Netherlands. So I'm just going to give you a hash mark. Hash mark. Here we go. Depravity is a thoroughgoing internal corruption. D 
Depravity is a thoroughgoing internal corruption. Job 14 asked the rhetorical question, who can make the clean out of the unclean? And the answer to that, of course, is no one. Job 15 says, what is man that he should be pure? Or he who is born of a woman that he should be righteous? What it means to be man in this phase of man's history and destiny, intrinsically, is to be depraved. Now, just a little asterisk and a footnote. It is not intrinsic to humanity to sin. What I mean by that is Adam and Eve in the garden were fully human and did not sin for a little while. The Lord Jesus Christ was fully human is still fully human and did not, never has, and will never sin. And for most of your existence, Christian, you will be unable to sin in your glorified state, having been conformed to the glory of the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not intrinsic to humanity to sin, except during this time period, (laughs) between the fall and glorification. And and while there is sin resident in us, depravity is a thoroughgoing internal corruption. To be human, again, aside from glorified saints and the Lord Jesus Christ, to be human now in this state on this earth is to sin by nature and behavior. Second hash mark, sin originates in the inner man and manifests in outward behavior. Sin originates in the inner man and manifests in outward behavior. This simply means we don't consider sins as those things that are most obvious to the casual observer. And and that is the way the world thinks about sin. It's whatever my ex-wife does. It's it's whatever Adolf Hitler does. It's, it's, It's whatever I want to criticize externally of someone else out there. But part of the corruption of sin is this camouflaging of the reality of sin as a thoroughgoing internal corruption that originates in the inner man, and that manifests itself in outward behavior. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 12, make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. See, long before there is an apple, there is a kind of tree that produces apples. Long before there is an external sin, noticeable, tangible, visible to the outward eye, there is an internal corruption that produces it. Matthew 15, 19 and 20, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. These are the things which defile the man. The internal produces that which is external. A third hash mark. Sin permeates the constituent parts of man. Sin permeates the constituent parts of man. And we begin here first with the heart. The heart. And and physiologically, we think of the heart as that muscle which pumps vital blood throughout the body. We think metaphorically of a heart as a a little symbol uh, that that represents lovey-dovey Hollywood affections. But biblically, the heart is that internal drive. It is the internal mechanism. It is the command and control center of the human being. So biblically, the, the heart is synonymous with things like the mind, the affections, and the will. We'll break some of these out in a little bit. There are some other words used for these. But the heart is the umbrella term for all of those features of the inner man. What drives you, what you think, how you feel. And listen to God's summary of the human heart, Genesis 6.5. Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And notice what's embedded in that statement in Genesis 6-5. The intents of the heart, that that which the heart intends, the the will is embedded in the heart, and the thoughts of the heart. That is, uh, the, the heart is not just all about feelings, 
Your feelings are uh, fueled and driven by what you think. It is the thoughts of the heart that are in the crosshairs of God's diagnosis here. And the totality of this diagnosis is striking. God said, every intent of the thoughts of the heart is only evil continually. That is not the indictment that man is tending to give to himself. That is not the way we treat one another. Even at our worst, we like to pat ourselves on the back and say, no, you're not all that. You're, you're not as bad as, as Genesis 6-5 would say you are. Because when we pat each other on the back, we are, in a sense, patting ourselves on the back. We want the communal endorsement that we're not as bad as God says we are. But God, who sees the heart and holds every man accountable, says very clearly that the thoughts and the intentions of the heart of man are only evil continually. And you might say, well, context is king, and Genesis 6-5 happens to come before the rest of Genesis 6 and 7 and 8. And what happens in those chapters? That, of course, is the worldwide flood, the cataclysm whereby God buried all of those sinners that he indicted in Genesis 6, 6, 6, 5 with a flood. But what do we find out just a couple of pages later after the flood, Noah and his descendants, there are now only eight people left on the earth and God's indictment of them is the same. Still sinners from the heart in Genesis chapter 8. So the flood didn't cure internal depravity, it just wiped out most of the guilty. Listen to Ecclesiastes 9.3. There is an evil in all that is done under the sun, and there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil, and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the dead. Solomon's assessment and God's assessment through the pen of Solomon is the same. It resonates with Genesis 6.5, that the heart of man is corrupt. The very fountain from which life comes is polluted. And what kind of life could emanate from a polluted fountain of life? Only a polluted life. Jeremiah 17 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And God says, I, Yahweh, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways and deeds. Jesus said in Mark 7, from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, and thefts. Let's move now to the mind. Again, heart is an umbrella term and it includes the mind, but sometimes the Bible separates out the mind to highlight specifically the thought processes, how we think, and depravity affects how we think. We, we should never assume that mankind is able to retain his rational, reasonable ability as if there were no fall or as if the fall did not affect the mind. You've seen the old TV commercial, if you're old enough, the, the anti-drug campaign, there was a frying pan and an egg. Do you remember this one? The frying pan, hot sizzling, the butter's already in there, an egg is cracked. This is drugs and this egg is your brain. Crack, crack, sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. This is your brain on drugs, right? That was the ad campaign. What is the human intellect like on depravity, right? This is your brain on depravity, Romans 3.10. There is none righteous, not even one, Romans 3.11. There is none who understands. There's none who understands. And he goes on and says, there's no one who seeks after God. There's no one who gets things rightly. And, and listen, we have eyes, we have logical capacities, we have brains and neural connectors and synapses that fire and create neural pathways, and we think thoughts, and we assume, well, I thought a thought, it must be right. After all, I can think, therefore I am. I can logic things out. Logic has worked before. Logic works in other realms. So I must be able to trust my mind. And depravity cries otherwise. God's indictment is otherwise. We don't think straight on sin. This has many radical implications. Theologians call this the noetic effects of sin. We dare not trust the rational capacity of those who irrationally are suppressing truth and unrighteousness by denying God's existence or living as if God didn't exist and wouldn't hold them accountable. 
God has placed the knowledge of himself in every human heart, and he's placed the knowledge of himself in the canopy of space and all over creation, and in every place you could go look at the created order, it is clear that creation screams God's glory. God has made himself known by what he has made so that men are without excuse. And so people who deny God's existence either actually, creedily, or practically by ignoring him are suppressing all of that truth, external and internal. They are suppressing that truth and unrighteousness so that they can live apart from the indictment of God's existence and the accountability for their own crimes. But what does such activity produce? Insanity. An absolute insanity in humanity. If you live your life suppressing what you know to be true, stuffing the knowledge of God inside a box and sitting on the lid and hoping that that knowledge won't get out, you know that it's there, but you're sitting on it and sitting on it with all of your effort. You are schizophrenic. You cannot think straight. The scientist can't go into the laboratory, put on a white laboratory coat and his spectacles, look, peer through the microscope or stare through the telescope and say, I have objective truth, there is no God. No, he's sitting on the truth that God exists in his own heart and in the creation itself. The problem is not facts with sinful man. The facts cry out what the facts cry out. The problem is the interpretive grid by which man assesses the facts. And if man doesn't want to live as if God exists, he must suppress the truth. And his suppression of truth, according to Romans 1.18, is itself unrighteousness. This is the rebellion inherent in the heart of man. To reject what is actually rational to claim an objective rationality and to have a corrupt epistemology, that is, a study of how we know what we know. Man doesn't know right. He doesn't think straight on sin. Listen to Ephesians 4. The Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, having given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Now, there are some factors that pile up in the, here in Ephesians 4 on top of the doctrine of total depravity. You have there the, the searing of conscience, uh, the Gentiles, that is a, a reference generally to unbelievers in that context, they, they, they live, <coughs> excuse me, according to a willful ignorance. That is, they know God exists and they suppress the truth. And that gives them over to a calloused conscience and a giving themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. And here's what sin does in the human heart. You reject the knowledge of God. You suppress the truth that God has clearly revealed externally and internally. You callous your own conscience and you go after more sin with greed and it compounds the disease. It exacerbates the problem. It is a snowball effect of depravity. But this is the condition into which every human being is born. Total depravity affects the mind. Next, total depravity also affects the affections, the affections. By affections, we simply mean that which affects you, that which you're affected by. It's similar to uh, uh, the category of emotions, uh, but it gets more at that which drives us. Listen to John 3, 19 to 20. This is the judgment that light has come into the world. And, and light there is appropriately capitalized, speaking of Jesus the Christ. But men loved darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. What is the truth here? Man is affected by what he loves. And what he loves drives him. 
And what's the truth in John 3, 19 to 21? Man loves sin, and sin tells him what to do. You will be governed by your loves. What you set your affections on, that is what tells you what to do. And, and what does sin tell men to do here? To reject the light. To love darkness. Because their deeds were evil. Listen, you, you can love your sin, and, and, and the light is an imposition on the sin. It's like when you've been indoors, and you've been inside wearing your dark sunglasses, and you've been inside, and the lights are turned out while you're wearing your dark sunglasses, and your eyes are closed, and then you walk into the noonday Arizona sun. If you have committed yourself to become accustomed with and to set your affections upon darkness, you'll run from the light. It's painful. It's, it's an indictment. It's an exposure that is uncomfortable. That is the condition of sinful man. Unless God does something radical, men who love darkness will scurry from the light like cockroaches scurrying to a new hiding place when you lift up the hiding place they're under. This is who we are by nature. Next, the will. The will. And we separate this out from affections. Affections might be considered the emotions plus the will. Here, we'll just separate out the will. What is man willing to do? What is man able to do? We'll get to human ability and inability in a few moments. But just consider this verse, John 540. Jesus said, you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. There was a statement of those who were rejecting Jesus' gracious words. And he makes the appropriate statement. You are unwilling to come to me. And what would be the result if they did come? Eternal life. These are words of mercy. Stiff-armed by an unwilling crowd. Now, is this unwilling just a matter of a 50-50 choice and a, a supposed independent, indifferent, disinterested free will? Uh, there is no such thing. Our wills are always constrained by internal things. And if you're a slave of sin, you're a slave of sin. That means your will is enslaved to sin. Sure, you can choose things, one thing over another. But a slave of sin cannot choose not to be a slave of sin in his own capacity. And so Jesus says, you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. He continues in the same verse, no one comes to me except the Father draw him. And here we're hinting at the gospel, the good news. That is from God, through God, and unto God, that God initiates and God executes, that without a supernatural, external, radical activity, sinful man will be forever left in his sinful unwillingness to come to Christ. So the will is affected by sin. And that's just crazy. We should want to come to Christ and have eternal life. All right, so sin permeates the constituent parts of man. Internal, external, the will, the mind, the affections. Next, uh, fourth hash mark, sin manifests itself in the various capacities of man. And I've just listed them all out there for you. If you want to get the references to all of these, by the way, uh, just send me a text or an email. I'll send you a copy of my notes. I didn't put them all up on the screen. But think about what man was designed by God to do. Man's primary reason for existence is to glorify God, to enjoy Him forever, as the Westminster Catechism says. Ever since the fall, however, man has employed his endowments in the pursuits of sin and evil. If all of man's constituent parts are affected by sin, what is the outworking of that in man's capacities? And if you just stop for a moment and think about what a marvelous creature man is, what is man able to do? And we might list out of a number of these for, for our purpose this morning. As I list them, I want to demonstrate how they are abused and misused. And I think this would be more pointed if we could take the time and show you how wonderful these capacities are in their original design. 
how they will be employed in the eternal state of glory and redeemed man. Just assume those for a minute. Man is wonderful. Man is great. Man was the superlative apex creature on day six of God's creative process. And man redeemed, conformed to the image of Christ will be a glorious being, a sub-region under God to rule in glorious, good, selfless lordship over God's created universe. Man is great except for the fall. And then we look at our capacities and how all these things are squandered. Speech. Speech. James 3, 2, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. The tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is itself set on fire by hell. Every species of birds and beasts, reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, I should say, restless evil, and full of deadly poison. Think about what Paul says about speech. Their throat is an open grave. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of asps is on their lips, and their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. With our mouths, we bless God and we curse men. These things ought not be. Think about man's capacity for creativity. We take what God made out of nothing and we rearrange it. Right? Our creativity is different than God's creativity. God creates ex nihilo. Uh, we rearrange things. But it is remarkable what man does when he sets his mind and his ability to things. Think about in the, in the very beginning of your Bible, Genesis chapter 4, pre-flood, first couple generations of man, uh, men are inventing iron implements. That is, they're getting iron ore out of the ground and they're making stuff with it. They're inventing musical instruments. Uh, Adam wrote poetry on the first day he existed. The, the ability of mankind to take what God has made and rearrange it creatively is staggering. What does man do with that incredible capacity to reflect and bring glory to God's genius through creativity? When corrupted by sin, music, art, engineering, literature have all become the implements of godlessness in the hands of sinful men. Destructive, self-destructive, globally destructive. Think about man's capacity for self-awareness and understanding. By the way, that's something that uh, broccoli doesn't have, granite doesn't have, dolphins don't have. The, the self-awareness that we are who we are. Proverbs 19.3, the foolishness of man ruins his way and his heart rages against Yahweh. What does man do with his, hey, I exist, I should do something with this. Foolishness and raging rebellion against Yahweh. The last thing natural man wants to do is joyfully submit to the sovereign rulership of God. He wants to be his own God. He wants to rule his own universe and not let anybody tell him what to do. He wants to claim existential autonomy. He denies the obvious reality that every breath he breathes is given by God. Every beat his heart beats is a gift from the sovereign one who will hold him accountable. Naturally, we act independent and autonomous. So our self-awareness has turned to self-exaltation. Think about man's sense of history and destiny, the ability to think outside yourselves. Uh, we write history books and we think about the future. Chimpanzees don't do that. Green beans don't do that. What do we do with this sense? We, we so easily start to live for the moment to pursue instant gratification, to become slaves to a Darwinian sense of self-preservation and temporal gluttony. Titus 3.3 says, we were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. Look, if we were truly aware of where we had come from and where we are headed, we would live differently than we do. We are corrupt. Think about man's intellect. Look, one of the effects of an inherited sin nature is the corruption of our intelligence. Like a computer virus, sin has gotten into our ability to think straight and process information. Our light 
has been darkened. Romans 8, 7, the sinful mind is hostile to God. Think about reason and rational ability. We've lost the capacity for clear, unobstructed logic and reason. Jeremiah 4.22, my people are foolish, they know me not. They are stupid children and they have no understanding. They're shrewd to do evil, but to do good they do not know. Think about the emotional palate of the human constitution. You were given by God the ability to weep and rejoice, to experience fear and delight. This grand palette of emotional capacity is a gift of God designed for the increased enjoyment of God's various excellencies. Instead, has become a fountain of misery and pollution. We don't feel as we should. We have to be corrected and told to align our feelings along with truth. Why? Because under sin, our emotions are misaligned. We don't think and feel as we ought. Out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and slanders. We tend naturally to live by our emotions rather than to harness emotions for the capacity for which they were designed. Emotions are designed to be the fuel for the will, based on right thinking. And we misuse all of that. Man has a capacity for morality. We have an innate sense of good and evil, but it has been damaged by sin. Although born with a knowledge of right and wrong, although having a conscience inside us, we spend our lives trying to reprogram, rewrite that knowledge. We love to call evil good and good evil. That is a product of the evil within us. Psalm 14, they are corrupt. They've committed abominable deeds. There's no one who does good. Yahweh has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. There is no one righteous, no one who does good, not even one. Think about our capacity for science. The human thirst for knowledge, our ability to study, they have been employed in every kind of vice and godless pursuit imaginable. What is thought to be objective science is often based on an anti-supernaturalistic presupposition. I'm going to start my inquiry into science convinced there is no God. Well, that's a terrible way to start science. (laughs) That goes against the scientific method as if that were even the authority. Such godless pursuits in our pursuit of inquiry cripples the pursuit of science at its very foundation. To ignore the most obvious truths that are revealed inside and outside the heart of man means that God has revealed truth to us and men claiming to be wise became fools. Folly is truly the descriptor over the modern version of what is called science. And immortality. Man is immortal, but he faces eternal death. Man was designed to live forever, to exist forever. And yes, man still will exist forever. But that immortality now under sin means an immortal existence under the just punishment of a holy God for that sin. Man in his natural state can't do anything to extricate himself from his sinful condition. Can't do anything to liberate himself from the slavery to sinful behaviors. And so he was always left in a corrupt state. And that corrupt state can only end in destruction, eternal death. Ephesians 2.1 describes our state naturally as dead in trespasses and sins. Romans 5.12 says, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men, on account of which all sinned. Listen, we start out from birth spiritually dead. David said in Psalm 51, in sin my mother conceived me. He didn't mean that his mother was sinning when she conceived. He simply means from conception, he was a sinner by nature. Think about what man does with responsibility or lordship. Man is designed by God to be a sub-region under God over God's created universe. What does man do with that? Um, Either lazy 
or lording in a sinful way. Think about what man does just with the stewardship of this earth. I don't care what happens to, to the temporary home I live in or worship the created thing rather than the creator. We err on both sides of the environmental issue. Man has not been a good steward of his environment. He's taken his capacity for dominion and, in, and exerted it sinfully in domination over other people. We fail to see the appropriate relationship between man and the created universe, between man and animals. You see these things where people elevate their dogs to the level of children, right? I hate people, I love dogs. Those bumper stickers are ubiquitous. We misunderstand the role that man has in the created order. We elevate the created thing rather than the creator who is forever praised. And then we exert lordship in all the wrong ways. I want to be in charge of the universe. I want God to not tell me what to do. I don't want people to tell me what to do. I want my way and it's everybody else take the highway. That is natural in the heart of man. Think about our capacity for adoration. Man was built to worship and if you had a Michael Jordan poster on your wall as a kid, uh, you understand the concept of adoration. Look at something great and adore it. We do this with mountains. We do this with interstellar space. We do this with human heroes. All of that is misplaced, but it reveals the heart of man built to worship. What does sinful man do with it? Worship everything other than the one true God. Idolatry is bound up in the heart of man. Calvin said, well, the heart is a factory producing idols. Think about our capacity for relationship to God. Man was created to relate to his creator. Isaiah 59 says, Yahweh's hand is not so short that it can't save, his ear is not so dull that he can't hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. When God told Adam and Eve to go away, to leave the garden, it meant that they could no longer have immediate fellowship with their maker to walk with God in the cool of the day, to converse with him freely. Sin creates a barrier. In the Garden of Eden, it was a, a cherubim with a flaming sword guarding the way back into immediate fellowship. Romans 8, 5 again says, those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. The mindset on the flesh is death. The mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It doesn't subject itself to the law of God. It is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Every man and every part of man is totaled by the devastating effects of sin. This has radical consequences. A last hash mark for you this morning. Total depravity demands radical, supernatural, external intervention if any sinner is to be saved. God's indictment of humanity on the pages of Scripture is so clear and it leaves us with nowhere to go if left to ourselves. Total depravity demands a radical, supernatural, external intervention if any sinner is to be saved. What does it mean that man is dead in his transgressions and sins? What is implied in Jesus' command, you must be born again? It means you don't have what it takes to appropriate salvation. One of the consequences of the biblical doctrine of total depravity is the corollary doctrine of human inability. And what we mean by that is that man is unable to rectify his situation, unable to extricate himself out of his total depravity, unable to liberate himself from his slavery to sin. To be dead in transgressions and sins doesn't mean that you don't exist. No, you're walking around in them, as Paul said in Ephesians 2. We walk in our transgressions and sins, but that walking is dead man walking. Dead in a spiritual sense. Physically alive, 
but spiritually, like the field of corpses, the field of skeletons in Ezekiel 36 and 37 that could not of their own ability re-articulate, put the hip joint, hip bone connected to the whatever bone. I, I got that wrong. Hip's a joint. Hip's not even a bone. Boy, I totally discredited this illustration. Ezekiel got it right. The valley of dry bones had to be breathed on by the spirit. That is, life had to be given external to the corpse so that life could happen. I believe if you get the doctrine of depravity right, you will get the gospel right. You will get the cure right. You will get salvation right. If we miss on the doctrine of depravity, we will either truncate the gospel or miss the gospel altogether. And I want to be clear, the five points of Calvinism, that they're not inherent to Calvin. They weren't come up with by Augustine before him, nor Paul before him. These are God's description of salvation of sinners. That man is totally sinful and unable to help himself, but that God provided the way of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, and actually gave as a gift faith and repentance so as to secure that salvation totally and completely and unchangeably for all who are his. Loved from the foundation of the world. That is God's gospel. That is the gospel that saved. But if you were anything like me, that is not the gospel I understood when I got saved. For me, coming to five points articulating the, the, the three words, God saves sinners, came later in life. If you're here this morning and you're thinking, I'm not sure if I agree with all five of those. That's all right. Um, our task is to unfold scripture and see the panoply of God's grace unfold and the riches of his gospel become more clear as we look at it in its details. That's what I hope to accomplish over the next five weeks. And setting the foundation for that is getting the Bible's view of man in his sin right. Sin is man's contribution to the salvific plan. You realize that's what you bring to the table. You bring sin. And you bring total depravity's effects on the will, the affections, the mind, the heart. You bring total depravity's manifestations in all of your capacities to the table. What does the sinner bring to the table of salvation? Only a dead, rotten, stinky corpse that has no life. That needs something that it itself cannot provide. And this is where we get to the good news. This morning has been all about bad news. Next week we get to begin looking at the unfolding of God's salvific plan. To rescue sinners to bring to them eternal life and to bring them to himself. Let's pray. God, thank you for uh, these reminders. Uh, for some, perhaps new insights for others. God, we really ought to be experts about our own natural condition. In other words, we, we ought really just to freely admit your indictment of us who we are in and of ourselves, who we have made ourselves to be, what we have done with our own lives left to ourselves. It is all as filthy rags before you. And the filthy rags can't clean themselves. The, the rebels against your will can't will themselves out of their predicament. The slaves can't free themselves. The dead can't make themselves alive. The uncircumcised of heart cannot circumcise their own hearts. The man with a withered hand couldn't stretch his out, and Lazarus couldn't walk out of his own tomb. And yet, by your gracious command, dead bones live. Lazarus walked. A lame man was healed and jumped. The man with a withered hand stretched it out. Those who were spiritually dead are born again unto eternal life. And for this, we give you praise. 
And we say with the Apostle Paul, from you and through you and to you are all things. To you be the glory forever. Amen.